done ancient Greece, we've done the Bible, now we're heading on over to ancient Egypt. To say I'm excited is an understatement. I love this stuff. Welcome back to The Hive, everyone. I'm your host, Rachel Fisher, and today we are soaring through some incredibly awesome, though slightly confusing, tales from ancient Egypt. Let's go. Number 10, Hathor. The goddess Hathor was originally created by her dad, Ra, as a destroyer of men. She was supposed to punish all those who were disobedient to him. But then Ra was like, meh, I don't really like that idea. He just kind of changed his mind and decided to make her the exact opposite. Instead, the goddess of love. But she kind of loved killing men and like even he couldn't stop her. So one night he gave her what was supposed to be a mug of ale but actually made it like a special kind of blood and she got so drunk off of it that she got too tired out to kill anymore and therefore became the goddess of love. <laughs> drunk in love, am I right? Her cult was centered in Dendera where she was also seen as the goddess of fertility and childbirth. When the Greeks occupied Egypt, they compared her with the goddess Aphrodite. But unlike the voluptuous woman Aphrodite was depicted as, Hathor came in three forms and I bet you can't guess which. She was depicted as either a woman with a cow's ears, wearing the headdress of a cow, or just a cow. Moo. <laughs> Number nine, the beginning of the world. I, yeah, what, a, what an inventive way to imagine the beginning of things. I mean, the Big Bang is still pretty crazy too, but hey, here we go. Freaking love how much magic is in these stories. Like I'm in, because that's all there was at the beginning of the universe according to the ancient Egyptians. Just swirling darkness, chaos, and magic. Heka, the god of magic, was the only thing that existed, waiting for the opportune moment to begin. Then a hill showed up called Ben Ben, and out of which the god Atum erupted from. He was lonely, so he mated with his own shadow to give birth to two children, Shu and Tefnut. Shu gave life, Tefnut gave order. They left their father to build the world, but they were gone so long, he took out his eye and sent it to search for them. In the meantime, he just kind of sat there contemplating eternity all alone. He was really sad. This guy sounds like Zeus mixed with Eeyore. Anyways, his kids came back and he was so happy he wept tears of joy and out of which were born men and women. They also brought his eye back, so that was nice. Number eight, light as a feather. So unlike a lot of religions we've heard of, there wasn't really a concept of hell in Egyptian mythology. It was either you were worthy of heading into the afterlife or you weren't. Maat was the goddess of harmony and supported the belief that if harmony was disrupted, it must be restored. Every ancient Egyptian myth in some form follows this format. But the most important role she played was in the afterlife. When the soul left the body, it would appear in the hall of truth in order to stand judgment before Osiris. The heart would be weighed on a golden scale against Maat white feather. If the heart was heavier, it would be devoured by a monster and the soul would disappear. If it was lighter, then you could go live in eternal bliss. So instead of several layers of burning torment, souls in Egypt instead faced eternal darkness and unconsciousness. The idea of non-existence was more terrifying than being cut up by demons. Huh. Number seven, Osiris and Isis. Okay, so we aren't strangers to deities being a fan of incest. It was kind of like how they multiplied and ancient Greeks were okay with it kind of, but they kind of weren't. Anyways, the Egyptian gods were no exception. Isis and Osiris were two of the four children of the goddess of Nut. Isis and Osiris were married and actually, really in love, they, they, they dug each other. When Osiris rose to the throne as the eldest sibling, his brother Set was pretty jealous. So he took the life of his own brother, cut him into little pieces and scattered them all over Egypt. He really wanted to make sure the guy was dead. But then Isis wasn't someone you wanted to mess with. She had great magical powers capable of restoring life. She collected all of the pieces of her brother slash husband and breathed life back into him. Osiris returned to life and they made all the love and then soon conceived a child named Horus. However, Osiris couldn't return to the land of the living, so he had to stay and rule over the underworld. So his son Horus was left to get revenge and we'll get to that later. Number six, Anubis. Now I think in West Western films that depict ancient Egypt, like The Mummy Returns, the god Anubis is often associated with the underworld. You know, that creepy half man, half jackal creature who appears to walk out of your nightmares? He's so creepy. Well, he did used to run the underworld until Osiris took over, but he was actually the god of mummification and the afterlife. So not wrong, but not the whole story. Anubis was the son of Nephthys and Set. Well. Kind of. Nephthys actually never conceived the child with Set. She kind of had a, 
She kind of had the hots for Osiris. So she disguised herself as Isis and made love to him that way and then Anubis came to life. That may have been one of the reasons Seth attacked Osiris in the first place as his suspicions rose. But it was actually Anubis who helped Isis piece together Osiris, creating the first mummy. Fun fact, during the Greek rule of Egypt, Anubis and Hermes were seen kind of as the same. The people who ferried the dead to the underworld. Oh sorry, and a point. Anubis was actually the one who weighed people's hearts, so he used the feather. The thing, you know what to do. He was responsible for doing that. Number five, Horus and Set. Speaking of Horus, earlier, remember how I said Horus had to take over defending his father? Well, here is where this story begins. When Horus grew up to be a man, he pulled a Hamlet. He was like, You killed my father, prepare to die. Thus, a series of battles ensued, and one of the gods didn't play fair. Set kept cheating at everything and continued to come out as victor. Not surprising since he didn't earn his way on the throne, he killed for it, kind of like a certain Claudius. Eventually Isis stepped up to help her son slash nephew overcome her brother. She set a trap for Set, but after some pitiless begging for his own life, she let him go. Horus was pissed, so angry some of the other gods got upset that he was so angry. They agreed to compete in a final boat race and Horus was like crushing it. He was doing really well, he was about to win. But then of course, Set cheated by turning into a hippopotamus and attacked the boat. Therefore claiming victory once again. Osiris finally showed up and declared that no man should take the throne through murder. So Horus took the throne. Why Osiris didn't just settle the whole deal from the beginning is confusing in itself, but hey, kind of reminded me of the eagles that showed at the end of Lord of the Rings that could have saved like three movies, you know? Kind of like that. Anyways, let's move on. Number four, Ra and his boat. Ra is one of the most revered gods in Egyptian mythology, especially since he was the god of the sun. He was depicted as a man with the head of a falcon. That kind of makes sense. He was once the greatest of all gods, but had to take a step back after he got too old and tired, and especially considering his task, I can see why. His job was to drive away darkness and sail across the skies, delivering light wherever he went. But at night, he would dive into the underworld and have to cross 12 gates. 12 hours, an hour per gate. After paying his respect to Osiris every night, a giant snake named Apophis tried to attack and swallow the boat. Every night! Poor guy, no wonder he got worn out. Every day it got harder to defend, and even one night, Apophis succeeded, but could only hold the sunlight for so long. She threw it up, which explained solar eclipses. After Set was cast out after the whole nephew battle, he ended up serving Ra in his boat and kept the snake at bay. But there's something confusing coming later that I think you'll agree is very confusing. So here we go. Coming up next, we have Bast, number three. Have you ever had a cat look you up and down and kind of like expect something? like worship, you know? Are you a cat person, dog person? Let me know in the comments. Well, that's because cats were a big deal in Egyptian mythology. They even had their own goddess. Bastet was a cat goddess depicted as a woman with a cat's head. Cats had a meaningful role in ancient Egypt as they protected their food from rats and snakes. They were even seen as family members and to harm one was punishable by death. Legend says that sometimes cats would enter burning buildings to save their families. If they died, the goddess would bring them back to life, hence the idea of cats having nine lives. There it is. Now here's where things get confusing. You know that story I told about Ra? Well apparently Bastet was in the boat with him as well. During the day she would ride with him, and at night she would turn into a cat and then defend the boat from Apophis the snake. But I thought that was set. So many conflicting things. I saw like a couple different stories who said, each thing was different, so who knows. Number two, Jeb and Nut. Yet another sibling partnership, we have Jeb and Nut. They fell deeply in love and could never be separated. They were that couple who would like constantly be like, oh my god, stop, right next to each other at dinner, you know what I mean? Jeb was the god of the earth and Nut was the god of the sky. A previously mentioned god, Atum, found their union inappropriate, so he pushed Nut into the sky far away from Jeb. He just didn't like being a third wheel. Jeb and Nut were close enough to see each other but can never hold each other again. And she gave birth to Osiris, Isis, Set, and Nephthys. Some say Horus too, but I don't think that's true. Number one, the treasure thief. Okay, I don't know how I feel about this story, okay? This doesn't really feel like harmony is in balance, but anyways. The treasure thief ends in a way I really didn't expect and I'm not sure you will either. Long ago, a great pharaoh with a wealth of riches decided to build a pyramid in which to keep them safe. One of the builders was wise to his plan and decided to find a way to claim them for himself. He built a stone vault with a hidden entrance covered by a slab so he could get to the riches. But unfortunately, he fell ill before he could return, so he told his sons of his plan. The sons headed to the pyramid in the dead of night, following 
following their father's order. But unbeknownst to them, the pharaoh had laid booby traps and one brother was caught in one. Not wanting to be found or interrogated, revealing his other brother, he told his brother to chop his head off. Ugh, that he did. Loyalty? I don't know. The pharaoh upon finding the body hung it up in the town square in the hopes of like weeding out whoever it belonged to. But the other brother being so clever got the guards drunk and stole back his brother's body in the dead of night. The pharaoh was like, I'm not even mad, I'm just impressed. He gave the thief a pardon, summoned him to the square and gave his daughter to marry him. Yeah dude, you tried to steal my jewels? Don't worry about it. Have my daughter, because you're so talented at your job. Great work. Anyways, I've been your host, Rachel Fisher. If you like this video, you know what to do. Slam that like button. And until next time, guys, stay sweet bees.